All right. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done with parametric modeling and computational modeling and a lot of these kind of advanced workflows. The things that I'm really interested in how to use it is how do we actually perceive a lot of the intangibles, right? A lot of the things that we don't see, you know, our world is becoming much more data driven. It's becoming a lot more um, involved in these scientific processes, a lot of things that we just don't actually see in our physical environment. And as landscape architects, we need to also be as in, involved in that discussion with these other stakeholder groups in order to have, you know, a louder and wider voice in these kind of discussions. And, you know, it comes from a lot of these forms of inspiration that have always kind of uh, directed my own research, you know, so there's a lot of these examples, obviously, you know, with uh, <clears throat> the Exposed City by Nadia Amoroso, you have the work by Edward Tufte, who does a lot of different infographics, as well as Bradley Cantrell's and demonstrating these um, environmental processes. And so these are the things that, you know, have always kind of intrigued my own interest. And you see that there is, again, kind of this building momentum of using these kind of things to not necessarily um, reinvent the wheel, but help us really just see our environment a little bit differently and help make better design uh, decision makings, which is I think one of the ultimate things that we wanna do when looking at different examples is how do we just open our eyes a little bit more to this process? Um, you know, so there is this kind of, um, storytelling that we need to use with design. Um, you know, we have these kind of conventional graphics where we use plans and sections and elevations and perspectives to help kind of um, explain things, but how can we also explore that a little bit further? What are those other kind of methodologies or drawing conventions to help with that? Um, this is something that we're typically seeing in the analysis process of design is that, you know, with technology advancing and with new innovative methods and media coming out, um, we're starting to kind of see this kind of work starting to get produced. And unfortunately, we can see uh, by looking at these examples that although, you know, we've gone from analogous to digital and now computational, a lot of these drawings are showing the exact same type of information. And that really becomes counterintuitive to using innovative and new methods. When we're starting to introduce these new forms of technology and uh, robust um, software to advance these kind of things, our perspective and our <clears throat> understanding and knowledge of these things should also advance the same way. Like I said, it's kind of contrary to this idea when we look at these three drawings that we still see the same kind of sun angles, the wind patterns, these concentric circles showing distance patterns, right? whether it's you know done by hand or thrown in a 3D space, it's really the same kind of information. There's nothing new being presented, which is again, a little unfortunate. So these are the things I'm trying to investigate further and push what can we actually do with advanced digital computational modeling. So here you can start to see some of these examples of student work um, <clears throat> that we do in our studios where we try to utilize, you know, this process of aggregating different data to look at different environmental systems that happen on a project site. So students can start to get a much more kind of in-depth um, understanding of erosion potential on a project site by looking at all the variables that affect it, such as vegetation, slope, soil textures, um, those kind of things, looking at different forms of outdoor comfort by using the existing vegetation and wind patterns and climate data to evaluate which spaces are more ideal for um, more intense programming versus areas that need to introduce new mitigation practices for climate control, and even wildlife habitat and understanding how different species um, either feed, nest, or uh, breed in these different types of plant communities. And when you're going through this process, you know, I think the biggest challenge is going from a much more convergent to divergent form of thinking. When we have a convergent, we almost have a preconceived idea of what we want the outcome to be versus a more divergent process where you're just using the data to tell us what is 
the needs of a project site. So you're almost using, again, the evidence, the information to dictate your next moves instead of almost trying to get the data in a contrived narrative to fit your own specific um, agenda. And I think that's what's also important is allowing that information to uh, prepare your next steps. And you know, what's good about this idea of using this data to kind of um, help direct issues is that, you know, it starts to kind of deal with really kind of larger problems too that are really starting to impact our world in a much more negative way, whether it's more of the natural things of climate change and drought and coastal flooding to even more of things of social equity and economic viability. So what's also um, I try to do with this research is really kind of tackle these kind of issues. So, Cause I think what's important is, about that is that it helps, you know, think about more of a larger impact that design can have versus just the immediate uh, site location itself. We can really kind of think about what, how can these ideas be replicable for other situations to have a much more compounding and profound impact. And so these are the things that I'm trying to use, you know, technology, information, and innovation to assist with this uh, design process. We can use it for understanding things as procedural. Um, in other words, demonstrating kind of the sequence of interstitial relationships. You know, a lot of these things, like I said, when you start to layer different variables, you start to have a much more robust understanding of a project site because you start to see the kind of relationships that um, environmental systems have with each other or social systems or economic systems. You can use it as a reconstructive process. So you're, again, kind of taking existing conditions and you're deducing them and reproducing new knowledge. And it can also be immersive where um, you can actually start to be in a project site at full scale in real time and making these experiential decision making, right? I think that's what we often lose sight of as designers, as students, as academics, even as professionals, is that we're just as much a part of the stakeholder groups and we should also think of ourselves as clients and users of a project site. So we should use, again, those kind of design instincts to help make spaces better designed for people. And so, I just want to show quickly these kind of three examples of, you know, this kind of process of, again, how I'm trying to utilize um, computational modeling and data to advance the way of thinking of space. So here's a very kind of typical site analysis where we have just an overlay of information. Unfortunately, it's often very static. It doesn't show, again, the temporal dynamics and changing conditions of the site. So here we see how um, rain events start to affect um, uh, stormwater and runoff on a project site for the city of, or the metropolitan city of Las Vegas. Here um, starts to show, I believe, yep, a video that again, kind of goes to this process of showing all these different systems. You can start to, you know, get a little bit more in depth with each one of them, but ultimately you want to show how they start to, um, affect each other. And you get a lot more kind of aggregation of data. So looking at uh, rain stations to show how, you know, rain and precipitation affect differently at different locations. What's good about this too, is that when you start to compile this into a computational modeling platform is that you can start to see things in a literal new perspective. So, you know, going from the conventional kind of top-down plan view where everything's two-dimensional to something that's more three-dimensional, introducing animations to show, again, this kind of process. So this map then converts into something that shows how different rain events throughout the different months and even years start to affect the city um, in different ways. So we really start to realize the dynamics of a city more than just, again, those kind of static snapshots of one condition. We can even take that same kind of data and overlay it now with things that are becoming a little bit more um, um, intriguing to this process with AR and VR. So we can start to, again, kind of take a whole nother 
kind of experience of understanding, again, this topic of stormwater on a project site. So in this video demonstration, we're showing how um, we're going to a site and looking at its existing conditions and how it's affected by runoff. We can start to actually place trees to start to mitigate uh, stormwater runoff. So we have this kind of layering of blue hues that you know is at one volume uh, with no trees and with you know the typical kind of concrete ground cover versus using things like permeable pavers and increasing the number of trees to start to reduce that runoff volume. So we can actually start to see what that would look like on a project site versus just from this kind of top-down uh, large-scale view. Oops. And so um, this is where we start to look at, you know, the dynamics of data. What kind of data is there that we can really start to explore? And some of the things that I try to really kind of um, go a little bit more in depth in is this idea of, you know, tangible and intangible. So a lot of times when we think of information and data that's intangible, it's out of sight, out of mind, meaning we don't um, readily think about those kind of things. As I've already shown, you know, the temporal changing of data, whether it's seasonal, whether it's evolving, whether it's atmospheric, it can even be anecdotal. So it doesn't always have to be uh, completely quantitative in terms of a large data set or big data. It can even be done through observational that we record and monitor over time. And then they, obviously the empirical where it's, you know, this proven accepted uh, collection of data that has been used, that has used scientific methods. And so how does that now become dynamic? Um, we can use this data through application, changing in scale, and even kind of blending both the analysis and design process. Um, this is, I think, something that's becoming really interesting um, in my own kind of research and exploration is that you know, we can start to embed analysis into the design process. So it doesn't have to be so much of these kind of separate silos of a design process, but it's much more comprehensive and integrated with each other. And so when we start to get into this idea of merging or thinking about how parametric modeling specifically helps with landscape performance, so the measuring of different ecosystem services, we think about how parametric modeling helps generate outputs. It doesn't really tell us anything specific. It just gives us, again, very specific um, kind of uh, generated information. And when we start to actually take that information and cross-reference it with things like project goals, with um, objectives, uh, client needs, that's when we start to actually understand the outcomes of its success is that, you know, you use the data to reference with um, these kind of things to really kind of de develop and evaluate uh, the effectiveness of your design. And one of the best ways to really evaluate and assess the design is that you're taking, again, kind of your existing conditions. You want to think about how was that site before, so that pre-development uh, kind of native ecology, and then what is your design actually doing? So when you start to actually not only cross-reference the data with project goals, but then you're also kind of looking at how your site has evolved and changed versus its conventional and even its natural condition, we can start to use those as baseline measurements uh, to determine how it's improved, right? Um, the main goal is that you're at least up hopefully improving it from its existing conditions, you might not necessarily get it to the same kind of performative benefits of its uh, natural condition when it comes to its environmental things. But, you know, hopefully the design is introducing some economic and social benefits as well that the natural ecology might not have been able to do. So here's an example. This is going all the way back to my graduate thesis that kind of started this whole exploration of uh, project site in a rural community in Haiti uh, called Fond de Blanc. Uh, this was, you know, fairly far away from the epicenter of the 2010 earthquake that displaced um, over half a million people to these rural communities. And when these, you know, rural communities took in a huge volume and influx in their population, it really put 
a burden on their infrastructure, specifically their water resources, in order to sustain these kind of communities. And so what we we're trying to do at the University of Tennessee was not only improve these water resource conditions, but also, again, take on the addition of a larger population. And one of the things that a lot of these rural communities struggle with is um, maintaining students in their uh, elementary and secondary schools. So part of the programming of this project site was introducing uh, teacher housing for these secondary schools. Uh, these, this allowed for, you know, more options to keep these students in classes and introduce more educational opportunities because a lot of times these students would drop out in order to provide for their families, specifically, you know, uh, working at the market, fetching water. These started to take a lot of time out of their days that they couldn't really allocate towards their education. And so, you know, part of the first thing was looking at this water security process. Like I said, you know, a lot of the times these uh, children had to go um, several miles to collect water uh, from the existing washes. On average, you know, they were taking on four gallons of water per resident. So we started to then look at, okay, when are these, what can we use on the project site to actually mitigate that by collecting water instead of having uh, the residents have to actually leave the project site to fetch water because like I said, it takes a lot of time out of their day. So in order to best evaluate that, we needed to understand uh, rain patterns uh, that we could collect from throughout the year. And so we started off by looking at these charts of when the wet seasons were versus the dry seasons. It was important that during those wet seasons that uh, we would try to collect a surplus of water in order to manage those drier seasons where it wouldn't be sustainable to collect water on site uh, during those time periods. So we utilized uh, rooftop collection as well as uh, stormwater collection on the site, and then even went into the process of determining what the water demand would be for the ne uh, necessities and essentials such as cleaning dishes, flushing toilets, showering. Um, so in order to really kind of understand that as well, part of this process was looking at, again, um, at a various scales, what's going to affect that climate data or those precipitation levels. So we can look at all the way at the kind of global scale of this North Atlantic subtropic high or this uh, Zoras high that would start to affect different uh, wind patterns that would either bring in uh, more of the wet air or the drier air when that uh, would go up higher. So this started to affect, you know, immediately what when those different seasonal changes would be. We could then zoom in a little bit further to see, you know, not only how did the wind patterns get affected, but, you know, the topography and the geomorphic formation of this island was also going to affect the wet seasons. So understanding the formation of these islands um, and how their kind of um, relationship with these different tectonic plates would start to create these uh, mountain formations of collision and uh, strike, um, striking with each other. This is, like I said, what created a lot of these uh, geomorphic formations, which would then affect create rain shadow. So even though a lot of the islands would receive anywhere between 53 to 98 inches of rain, our project site was located within a rain shadow. So it would only get 29 to 19 inches of rain. And so I think what's really important in understanding this is that, you know, data really needs to be investigated at different scales because at, again, first glance, um, it seems like it gets a lot of rain, but when you start to really get into the nuances and details of the site, we start to see that it's actually significantly less. And then once again, kind of zooming in all the way to the project site, what happens to that water once it actually hits the ground? So we start off by looking at the drainage patterns. We can start to see where the water runs off the site immediately versus where it might drain and collect um, within a uh, on-site ephemeral stream. This helped establish different 
uh, drainage regions within the project site. So it essentially created four distinct areas. The grading helped us determine what can be um, regraded, which areas need to uh, be deemed as unsustainable. We looked at the infiltration pattern. So, you know, where is this water going to just completely run off? Is it going to um, infiltrate into the ground and recharge the groundwater? How does the vegetation start to, you know, um, create different conditions? So areas that can be used for preservation, areas that can be used for um, kind of clearing because it doesn't have a significant of an impact. And all these kind of, again, layers of information that was just demonstrated to us helps us give us a much more comprehensive understanding of the runoff potential and where that runoff would actually go on site. And so a lot of these graphics were inter interactive so that not only the clients, but also any type of um, user can understand these project sites a little bit more comprehensively. And then at the final kind of culmination of looking in at a very specific detailed site, we can start to, again, look at um, this information at an even higher level of um, information. So this really kind of starts to break down the potential runoff and stormwater collection on the project site. So you start to see just how, you know, different perspectives, different scales of information start to give us different answers. And then from a lot of that analysis, we could then start to assess how do we actually design and improve on this and utilize this. So based off of that information on the project site, it was uh, determined and decided it would be most effective as a terracing because of the slope conditions and the vegetation conditions to create more of a terrace landscape, which would then be able to um, manage this agricultural uh, production. Um, that way, you know, on-site uh, farming can be done for this community. And um, this research was the first, you know, opportunity with that I got uh, published in a the book Innovations in Landscape Architecture by Rutledge as well. This then again kind of expanded to my opportunities after graduate school where one of the first projects I did was with um, how, housing and urban development grant project at the University of Tennessee where we use again kind of the same approach or at least these are the things I tried to bring to the project of looking at these different site conditions really starting to get into this more kind of comprehensive graphic narrative of different things that affect the water resources in East Tennessee. And how can we start to, again, reveal a lot of these intangibles of a project site? So this was less temporal based, but more so kind of the intangibles of what's happening in water um, outside of the surface, whether it's through the air or below ground. And so we use a lot of these um, section perspectives and overlaying methods to elaborate more on the um, effects of development in this area, as well as what green infrastructure can start to do to help improve East Tennessee. Um, other experimentations with data is looking at um, other methods of collecting data, in this case, using drone. Uh, uh, scanning techniques to understand and get more detailed uh, modeling of an area. So we use photogametry in this example of starting to actually um, scan different settings. So you can see, you know, from these point clouds that would be collected from this drone footage, you can use it in a variety of ways. And depending on the level of scanning you can do, you can get very detailed models. So here's pretty much using that point cloud um, and using all actually the colors associated with it to even give us, you know, a decent aerial image of it that can then within Rhino start to actually translate into a uh, physical terrain model. You can see just the detail where you get out of that, where you can actually see the tracks um, for this BMX project site. 
And so from that, like I said, this drone footage, once you kind of get that high level of point data, you can start to do a lot of things from that, whether it's doing just, you know, aerial um, imagery, doing elevation studies, slope analyses, physical modeling. Once you get that, you can start to kind of open your uh, doors to a lot of other opportunities. Another example of using, you know, data um, in a much more dynamic platform is looking at tree benefits. This is again becoming a very uh, common exploration of urban forests within different cities. We can start to, you know, utilize tree inventories to assess, you know, what are they doing for our built environment? Um, are they successful? Are they struggling? What can we really kind of start to gain from that? And so this was a grant funded project from the Nevada Division of Forestry to begin the process of inventorying and analyzing trees and uh, specifically parking lots. So we began the process of, you know, after collecting the data of the trees in these areas, we started to assess what can a, what type of benefits can they provide. So looking at the social benefits of health and well-being, understanding how different colors, different foliage, different textures can have different effects on how spaces are enjoyed. Looking at the wildlife habitat that different planting communities can have, you know, looking at seasonal bird migration, looking at where do they prefer to perch, where do they prefer to nest, and where do they actually find their food sources. The big thing that, you know, unfortunately, you know, sometimes drives most decisions is the dollar sign and the economic side of these things. And so we obviously wanted to demonstrate that as well. So we, again, kind of looked at all the monetary benefits that come out of trees, whether it's um, energy savings, property value, stormwater savings, a lot of these things were starting to be collected and assessed. And what was most important about this was determining, you know, when do these trees actually become a return on investment? Uh, that's a big kind of selling point when doing these um, assessments of urban forestry is really determining when does it actually start to make a significant impact because you have to first, you know, account for things like uh, purchasing costs, maintaining costs, all these things that actually require to maintain and keep these urban forests alive. Those are obviously going to cut into those monetary benefits. And so we actually found out that um, there's an interesting kind of uh, situation in our urban tree forests that'll get into later on based off of that data. Then the other kind of categories we looked at were its environmental benefits. So how do these trees uh, collect or intercept stormwater runoff as well as sequester CO2? And what's really important from this thing is that when you hear and uh, learn a lot about tree benefits, often you're given kind of this boilerplate or standard kind of metrics of what trees do in terms of their benefits. Looking at all these examples, you can see every tree performs a little bit differently. So this gives you a better understanding and knowledge of what trees to use for which situation. There's really no kind of silver bullet tree that we found that could perform and uh, solve all those issues. So you have to really kind of understand what the project needs are. We then, you know, apply these same principles of those tree benefits onto project sites to um, try to mitigate the other issues such as flooding, um, heat islands, uh, accessibility. And what was really kind of interesting from this analysis with the students is that we found out that, you know, in most of the project sites on the UNLV campus and the parking lots is that we were actually able to uh, provide somewhat of an urban forest in each of these parking lots without actually losing any parking stalls. We were able to at least maintain 95%. Some students were able to, were able to actually add additional parking stalls um, in addition to having that urban forest inside of it. So I think the interesting takeaway from that is that we really just found out that we're really terrible at designing parking lots that, you know, you always hear this argument that as soon as you start to add trees, you lose stalls. That's actually not the case. I think it's just we're being lazy about this process. And so these students, again, not only showed how you can plant a lot of trees, but what does all those benefits come with planting trees and parking lots? So these are some of the student examples of what they're able to achieve. 
So like I said, you know, I've taken that research and explored it a little bit further um, for the entire um, UNLV campus with their different tree benefits. Um, so looking at, again, that tree data, I went back to those same kind of categories of their monetary economic benefits, their stormwater potential, as well as their CO2 sequestration. And we basically kind of aggregated that all into these um, charts to figure out, you know, when do these trees actually begin to have a return on their investment? And you can see on this large chart on the left is that the average tree age is around 13 years where it starts actually um, account for all those costs associated with it based off of their own benefits. And a thing I didn't mention earlier is that a lot of the urban trees in Southern Nevada and Las Vegas don't actually last past 13 years. So it's really kind of an unfortunate situation where these trees don't actually begin to provide benefits until around 13 years when that's when they usually uh, live to. So we're kind of in this constant kind of um, replanting and recycling of trees where we, 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 where we really aren't ever kind of reaching their full potential, which is unfortunate. And so we use that and kind of apply that to all these benefits to determine when do these trees actually perform um, and start to actually um, achieve specific benefits. The good thing with uh, carbon sequestration is that, you know, on average, the trees will get there around 3.4 years. Unfortunately, with CO2 sequestration from trees is that they will also digress, meaning um, they'll actually start to underperform after so many years because they've essentially reached their full capacity of sequestering CO2. So here's this kind of process where we, again, modeled and inventoried all the trees on the campus. We use that and started to cross-reference it with these different cost savings. So we were able to actually locate um, areas that were performing really well. And this helped us kind of determine and create these strategic maps for the campus on areas that need to be preserved and maintained because they're doing well. It also um, identified hotspots that were underperforming. However, within uh, five years, they can start to reach that full potential. So it was really important that we start to identify these areas to ensure that these trees eventually reach that potential. And this is, again, kind of looking at all these different benefits. So again, areas that are doing really well versus the areas that are struggling. And so we can use this to kind of even make future projections um, based off of their different benefits. And there's these charts that also kind of start to explain each tree in terms of where it is within this kind of beneficial process versus where um, it can eventually meet it, or if it won't ever meet its uh, kind of optimal performance. So, like I said, a lot of this information has been done using parametric modeling. And so this has, you know, gotten me to the opportunity to actually get this published in a book uh, titled Landscape Performance Modeling using uh, Rhino and Grasshopper with Rutledge. And so I'm going to show you, you know, a couple of examples so you're getting a little bit of a sneak peek of what's going to be produced in this book. And what's good about it is that it's actually an instructional book where you, you're not only going to see all the potential that can be used with parametric modeling, but hopefully you're able to actually replicate it because it actually goes through the whole modeling process. And so it starts off by kind of talking about how do we start to collect data for this modeling process. Um, it starts to actually cross-reference and relate to the landscape performance series methods, which are these established ways of actually measuring the landscape. Like I said, it's, it is an instructional material. These are, you know, some of the scripts that you're going to have at the end of this. So they're not exactly the most uh, simple ones, but it does take you step by step to get to this whole process. We start off by kind of inventorying uh, different site conditions so we can, again, begin that process of analyzing them. And then in these examples, we start to see how we can utilize this. This is actually an animation. It's not necessarily in the book, but this is something that can be produced. Where, again, this idea of kind of looking at distance uh, differences uh, becomes really important. 
We can look at the erosion potential of a project site to help us determine what's either um, creating that erosion or what can be used to alleviate and prevent that erosion along uh, main drainage lines on a project site. Looking at ecological succession, so looking at where um, vegetation might originate at and within a kind of um, revitalization process and how that can start to grow from those points. Looking again at different stormwater uh, runoff potential on different project sites based off of their um, surface conditions and storm events. This is one of my favorites where we can really start to see the shading potential of a project site. So not only just looking at it at a um, single point of time, but where do areas have high hours of shade? So the areas that are really blue are areas that are getting you know anywhere between seven to eight hours of shade throughout the day versus areas that are getting you know half that in the more purple tones, and then the areas that are only getting you know maybe one or two hours. So we can actually start to see these cold spots of shade to tell us you know whether we need to do more planting or uh, less planting in an area. How we can use uh, trees on a site to act as windbreaks uh, to help again kind of create uh, microclimates for warm conditions when conditions are extremely severe and cold. So this has also been you know utilized for other projects that deal with social equity issues. So it's not always kind of driven towards these environmental things, but how can we actually address topics of food deserts? And so this was our latest kind of research project. Uh, this was actually getting funding from the US uh, Forest Service, so the USDA, in helping to combat um, food deserts in Southern Nevada. And so we start off again, kind of looking at what the overall kind of condition is of food deserts nationwide in the United States. It's really kind of sad and unfortunate that in the US, one out of four people don't know where their food is coming the next day. So we have a very kind of high percentage, in my opinion, of people that are living within a food desert. And so we began this process of really understanding what defines a food desert. And so, you know, at this kind of national standard, it really comes down to low income and low level of access. Um, you can see how Nevada ranks within the food desert. So we're ranked as the 12th highest um, city that has um, food insecurity. But what was important to us in this investigation was, you know, what really is a food desert in Southern Nevada? When it comes to, you know, Southern Nevada, we have a very kind of transient community, a very diverse in terms of senior citizen living, a lot of uh, large households. Um, and so these are the kind of things that we first wanted to understand in terms of the demographics. And then the other things that were really compelling too is that this idea of low access uh, dealing with distance has a huge effect too on what defines a food desert. For the most part, a food desert is defined as areas that have uh, that don't have access to fresh food with, um, within a mile. So anyone outside that mile is considered a food desert. But when you look at, you know, the climate conditions of Southern Nevada, um, we have extremely high temperatures where, you know, it can be 110, 115 degrees out. So whether that grocery store is a mile or, you know, 200 feet away from your house, you're probably not going to want to go out to it um, with those kind of temperatures. So that distance really becomes almost um, undefined because it's just too intense to even actually um, consider. So we looked at, again, all these different kinds of variables for food deserts, um, whether it's the specific demographics, the land cover point data. We use these to essentially create a, a linear grading method to figure out or linear rating method to figure out which areas are classified as a food desert. So once we kind of looked at each variable with this um, ranking system, we were able to create a more comprehensive one. Like I said, you know, what, what the data and the modeling helped with in this process was really kind of helping defining that one mile distance to a grocery store. And that typical kind of radial distance of 
um, measuring areas, we can see on the left how many residential households are located within that distance. However, as you can see on the map on the right, rarely do you have that direct line to a grocery store. So if we actually look at the network distance of using roadways and trails, the actual infrastructure that we use to get to a grocery store, that that one mile network distance is significantly smaller than that radial distance. And what's really unfortunate about that is that when we ran this kind of analysis on all these grocery stores within Southern Nevada, that this actually excluded 40 to 70% of our residents. In other words, it was saying that a lot of these communities on the um, edges that were outside of that one mile network distance, but were still considered within that one mile radius distance that the National Food Desert um, standard utilizes, is that those people are being told that you're not actually located within a food desert, even though you are technically uh, physically outside of that one mile distance. So it puts you know, a high percentage of residents at a disadvantage. And so these were kind of what's led to these final results of redefining what a food desert was in Southern Nevada. And this process was kind of utilizing census tracts within different municipalities. So that way, you know, out of all these different jurisdictions within the metropolitan Las Vegas area, we could hand off these strategic maps to these different uh, city officials to make plans and efforts to uh, remedy these issues. So the last thing I'm going to talk about um, is uh, the use of augmented reality um, in some of these parametric modeling methods. What's good about it is that we can actually start to integrate these models into other platforms, which makes the information even more exciting to utilize. With AR and specifically landscape performance, we look at the kind of different benefits and potential of merging or integrating uh, different performance metrics within the design process, how it can be something that's very participatory and engaging. So what's fun with these models is that in the AR platform, you actually have the ability to move and scale and change different conditions to see what the results will be from those decision making. And then even again, like I've been discussing those intangibles. So we're not using these AR models just for a spatial and perceptual understanding of it, but what are those other kind of specific metrics and data that's associated with those different conditions? And so uh, it helps with the design process. It creates a hybrid uh, process as well. We looked at the impact of decision-making, and then lastly, kind of the byproducts of this process. So here's some examples, kind of this element at the very kind of uh, rudimentary process of, you know, using a kinetic scan to um, look at kinetic sand uh, to start to actually um, evaluate the stormwater runoff. I don't know why that pause or slow down. We can use these AR or these Aruku um, markers to help, you know, create different conditions of trees. And so the first part of this process of using AR was looking at, you know, there's the potential of using a project site as kind of a game board. And then you have these Aruku markers as game pieces. So it actually kind of starts to create something that's, again, very, you know, in its essence, playful and engaging to help actually build on this educational process. Like I said too, you know, the same idea is that we can actually go out to a project site and start to place these pieces on our game board in real time and at full scale. So we can see on the left what the interface looks like um, through a, a, a smartphone device. So we can place, you know, just the basic kind of design elements of pathways, benches and seating and trees. And then, you know, once we kind of start to place them, we can even start to uh, remove them. We can start to go over to them, replace them. We can start to change their scale, all being done in real time. And what's happening on the right is something that's actually being uh, recreated back inside of Rhino software. So you aren't really limited to having it just in your smartphone device, but you're actually then 
having access to something that's very kind of schematic and a starting point within a Rhino model. You can see, you know, this helps create these kind of clay model renderings for storyboarding to eventually render out uh, in Photoshop. Like I said, since they've gone into Rhino, you can then take those models and start to create those conventional uh, graphics to start to create this kind of rapid iteration. And then, like I said, you know, not only can you treat them as just these kind of clay spatial modelings, but then you can even start to integrate those performance metrics. So in this example, we're looking at, you know, the economic viability and the stormwater potential of using things like permeable pavers in an asphalt parking lot, um, and then even changing the different ground covers as well. And so with every kind of decision of placing these kind of modules, we can start to see what the costs are associated with it, what the runoff reduction potential is. Uh, so it's not just kind of a byproduct that we assess afterwards, but we're actually doing it simultaneously. Let me see if I can jump up a little. Like I said, the same thing's happening where we're getting this in a Rhino model as well as um, out on the project site. Um, other, you know, opportunities with this is using it more as kind of a uh, diagramic um, perspective where it's just kind of these more thumbnail models that we can start to explore so we can see how it's utilized, again, for looking at how different slope conditions and the number of trees and their placement will affect uh, runoff. You can look at how on the right, the placement of uh, benches can be more strategically placed in the shade or in the sun, depending on what those needs are. So it's usually kind of more uh, a user preference of what these kind of scenarios should be. And these are just some of those kind of thumbnail diagrams that we explored with in terms of these specific topics. So, you know, dealing with those microclimates of heat stress and cold stress, stormwater and erosion potential, and even accessible pathways. And like I was saying before, you know, you can look at different um, scenarios and different parameters to really kind of assess and evaluate these different conditions. So what helps is kind of creating these uh, different scenarios where on the three examples here, whether it's a fairly flat topography with a few trees or a very steep topography with a lot of trees, they're all generating about the same amount of runoff. So you start to understand the relationship of what slope and vegetation have on different runoff uh, potential. And so this was the latest kind of advancement of this topic that was presented at CELA last year of using it again as this kind of decision-making process where it, these same kind of, you know, piecemeal examples I've been showing have been incorporated into a um, established kind of platform. And so with this, the students were actually using an Oculus Quest within the sandbox uh, media to actually start to create their own topography within a scenario of a uh, pocket park in a residential lot. So you can see how the students are, you know, using the sand to create a very specific topography. They're then putting on these um, Oculus Quest to go into this virtual reality and starting to place trees, which I'll show a video of. And so again, this is using this uh, combination of computational parametric modeling. Uh, with landscape performance. So here you can start to see, again, just some snapshots of different scenarios based off of the same kind of tree placement. So looking at energy savings for the housing units nearby or looking at the potential uh, runoff that's being managed. Again, using this kind of under the hood operation of this, it's a very kind of comprehensive and very, um, complex script where we're using a dedicated station to uh, process all this data. Here's kind of the workflow of what's happening uh, within this actual station itself. So at first you have this Xbox Connect that's scanning 
uh, some play sand that's being created by the students. That's being, again, calculated and processed through a dedicated PC using a wireless router connecting to the Oculus Quest. You're starting to actually see this um, scaled down project site um, with inside of your uh, VR headset and starting to uh, immerse yourself more in that. So here's some video footage of um, this process of, again, what it looks like as you're kind of recreating and molding the landscape. In this example, you can start to see how it's affecting the drainage and runoff collection on the project site. And again, a lot of the data is always being kind of tabulated during this process. So you aren't just doing it through a visual perspective, but you're also seeing what the data is telling you as well. So, um, so we looked at, you know, in testing this model out different environmental, social and economic benefits. So like I've always been talking about this idea with stormwater management and runoff sequestering CO2, as well as energy savings for buildings. And so I'll show you again, some quick examples of this process. So using the Oculus Quest and the controllers, you can start to see how students can start to place trees on the project site, as well as their potential uh, stormwater interception um, on the project site. And so the students found out that the closer they put the trees, near these main drainage lines, the more effective they would be. So you're starting to understand this relationship of placing trees in um, strategic locations and not necessarily um, in a very kind of arbitrary process. The same thing, um, or in this case with CO2 sequestration, um, you know, um, air pollution isn't exactly a point source pollution, meaning there's not an actual, um, often a identifiable location for it. For, so in this scenario, students found out that it really didn't matter where they placed the tree. It just mattered um, that they tried to place as many trees as possible on the project site. And so you can, again, see kind of the individual benefits that each tree would be sequestering with CO2, and then the overall kind of combination of all of these trees. And so each one of these scenarios also had kind of a narrative or kind of a guideline for the students explaining, you know, based off of the number of residents and the number of vehicles that they drove, that they would be producing so much uh, carbon emissions. So how many trees would it take to actually sequester that? And, you know, a lot of times they found out that no matter what they did, they wouldn't be able to solve the issue on project site with trees or landscaping alone, that it also required some behavioral changes. So, you know, instead of, you know, driving to work every day, maybe using a bicycle or walking instead of driving would help cut down on carbon emissions. And so I think that's what the other kind of major outcome of this was to learn that, you know, with solving a lot of these design issues, that it's not just a design issue, but it's also a human. Um, response as well of what we can do better as uh, citizens of this planet. And here you can again kind of see as you place trees further from buildings, they're almost having no energy savings. The closer you place them, the better they do. When it comes to energy savings as well, the closer they are to the south um, facing facades that are exposed the most to sun, those ones are going to perform much more effectively than ones that are facing the north or um, the east, where it's less um, hot and less intense from the sun. And you can start to see how each building starts to have different levels of energy savings associated with the location and distance of these tree placements. So in this scenario, you can see that the majority of trees placed by students were as close to the buildings as possible and not so much on the inner parts of the park. So what was really kind of interesting about this process is that again, depending on what the needs are of a project site, what the stakeholders might be really interested in in solving through the landscape is that it created much more different um, planting outcomes.
And I think that's something that should be really kind of understood. So, you know, in concluding, just showing this idea that, you know, with computational modeling, it allows us to have a lot of um, ability to test different scenarios, test different iterations, and using the data to kind of explain how each scenario varies uh, from the other, from a data and analytical perspective, and not just a spatial one. And I think what's also important, too, through this process is that you'll find out that there's really no a uh, silver bullet solution, but rather thinking about a hierarchy and tiering of benefits that can happen. And that's what's really important when you're working with a client is figuring out first what's their primary need or primary goal that they want to have addressed and working from there, but also providing a level of secondary and subsequent benefits as well. So, you know, what's important is that you're using this data to tell your own kind of story with design and utilizing the data to help with that process. So thank you.